What is up you guys? Welcome back to Consuming Crime with Jen and Jules. Um, before I get into the case, make sure you guys give us five stars wherever you're listening. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, now we're on YouTube, and Pandora is still pending. The five stars really help guys, so please, 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 if you can please do that. That would be awesome. And then also spread the word. You know, if you like us, tell others about it. My source for today's story is going to be the same thing I've been using, Cold Case Files. I think it's still season one, episode five. I know it's called Sweetheart Silence, which is also the name of this episode. On Saturday, August 9th in 1980, high school sweethearts Tim Hack and Kelly Drew attended a wedding reception at the Concord House in Fort Atkins in Wisconsin. It was just a regular day. The couple did not have a care in the world. Tim was a farm boy and Kelly was a city girl. Their lifestyles were completely opposite. Tim's family was surprised that a girl like Kelly would visit Tim and help him on the farm. Tim's father, Dave, owned a farm and the plan was to pass it down to Tim once he felt that he was able to handle the responsibility. That was until the night of the 9th. As I mentioned, Tim and Kelly were attending a wedding reception of a close friend of theirs. The plan was to stop by, say hello, and then attend a local fair. Unfortunately, they wouldn't even make it to their car. Witnesses say that Tim and Kelly arrived at around 10.30 p.m. Tim had a beer to drink and Kelly had a soda. After about 30 to 45 minutes, they left, which is an awful short amount of time and I kind of wonder maybe they went to the car to grab something because, I mean, unless they were really close and they just really wanted to go to the fair, I don't really know the eagerness. Well, I mean, the fair is always like a good time, especially if you're like a couple. Fast forward to the next morning. This is from the point of view of Patrick Hack, which is Tim's brother. He was extremely concerned. Tim always informed his family if he wasn't going to be home or if he was planning on staying the night with a friend. Him and his father, Dave, knew he had been with Kelly the night before. Dave calls Kelly's mother. He asks if she had seen or heard from either of the two. She says no. She also had not seen them since the day before. Because Tim was such a responsible kid, Dave knew there had to be something wrong. There was no way Tim would let his family worry about him the way that they were. Dave drove to the Concord house where the reception took place. He saw something that would make any parent's heart sink into their stomach. It was Tim's car. Upon closer look, he saw that the front door hadn't been shut all the way and Tim's wallet was inside. Something happened to Tim and Kelly. Dave called the sheriff's department immediately. Officers arrived on scene and conducted a full sweep of the vehicle. They confiscated cigarette butts, Tim's wallet, among other items for fingerprint testing. There was no indication of a struggle, no blood, no nothing. The family maintained hope. They wondered if maybe they eloped. Apparently, this was discussed previously. I don't think you will leave your car behind and your wallet behind if you're going to elope. See, and that's my next point, is when you're going to get married, don't you need your ID? Mm-hmm. I mean, I understand they're probably just trying to keep hope, but... I think they're just in denial, which is really yeah. sad, because you can't help that. But the car, I'm sure they would need that to get where they need to go in the know. wallet. I'm sure they need some form of identification. Mm-hmm. On top of this, Tim was extremely close with his family. He would have wanted them there for sure. In the first four days following the disappearance, officers questioned wedding guests, co-workers, neighbors, really just anyone that could have seen anything, something. They hit on a lead. The wedding guests did report seeing a dark, dirty van that was in the parking lot of the Concord house. They claimed that whoever was driving the van drove off very quickly and in a suspicious way. The Concord House parking lot was dimly lit and right by an interstate, so it's not the safest area to be in. And it wasn't mentioned, but I don't think there were security cameras. It's always a van. It's always a van. I hate vans. The community got together to start one of the largest manhunts in Wisconsin history. They searched the Concord House, vacant buildings, the roads, and more. What I like about the cases that I've been talking about recently is they all seem to be smaller communities that unite you know, as like a whole front every time something like a someone goes missing. And I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, because they need all the help they can get. And the fact that people are willing to help like for free at no expense to like the people that need it. That's really, that's dope. On Friday, August 15th, six days after the disappearance, a teenager was driving his tractor on a field when he spotted something. It was a pair of pants. He called police immediately. He had most likely heard about what happened to Tim and Kelly as well. Officers and family confirmed that this was the pair of pants Kelly was wearing the night of the disappearance. The pants had been cut both on the right and left pant leg, all the way from the ankle to the waist. This told police that she had been raped. Over the next 10 days, more pieces of clothing were found along County Road E. Another interesting piece of evidence found by police was rope. 
The rope is important because it had been tied in square knots and half hitches, which are like just fancy schmancy ways of tying rope. So whoever did this to Kelly knew their way around rope tying. So wouldn't it be like military or mm-hmm. like um, scouts? Like or military, or... ex-military, even like a, what is it? What did I, a carpenter even? Oh. And more importantly, if they could find this person, would they be able to tell tell them where Tim was? Days turned to months, no more leads. And then, on Sunday, October 19th, 71 days after the disappearance, hunters, and they're like squirrel hunters, so apparently people go out in the woods and hunt squirrels for fun. What is the purpose? Like, literally be, just for like, fun? Just, just to, to be like, like got them, and then... Yeah. And that's just, that's trash on its own. Anyway. So they're walking through the wooded areas, and they stumble across a body that had been badly decomposed. They called officers who confirmed that the body was, in fact, Kelly Drew. Just a hundred yards away lay Tim Hack, dead, still fully clothed in what he had worn the night of the disappearance. The insane part about the discovery is that they were found just seven miles from the Concord house. Do we remember largest manhunt in Wisconsin history? Bitch, where? They, but, okay. Where did you look? <laughs> Are there no dogs back in those days? Because a dog would have smelt that. I mean, is it a dense area? Mm. Yeah, because I feel like maybe it depends on the area. And then people are just walking by. Like, if they don't see it, I don't think we're like... I think I'm just mad and I need someone to talk crap yeah. to. <laughs> you That's Wisconsin folks. <laughs> <laughs> there had been ligature marks on Kelly's ankles and wrists, and she had also been strangled. They were able to rule her cause of death as strangulation due to the markings and insect activity around her throat. Officers release information that whomever was involved had knowledge in knot tying and rope. Tips began flooding in. However, one tip in particular stood out among the rest. A woman called in claiming that she believes her husband was involved. They lived around the area where the bodies were found, and we're going to call this guy Mr. James. Mr. James carried a knife on his belt at all times. He owned a van, and he does roofing work, which requires him to be good with rope. On August 10th, shortly after the disappearance, he had his wife and daughters clean out his van. Which brings the question, why didn't you clean your van? And that's the weird part. A search warrant was issued, and officers went to search his home. They were able to find clothing that was similar to Kelly's shirt in regards to color and the way it had been torn. They had also found rope that was tied in knots and what looked like blood on the rope. They sent the clothes into the lab for testing. Mr. James' wife claimed that he was violent an alcoholic and had even tied her up before i don't like the wife at this point in the documentary i just get weird vibes i don't trust her i don't believe her another reason why i don't like her and i'll mention this in a second however one thing she said stood out to me and the officers of course she said that her daughters were being sexually assaulted by him like who are these claims coming from from the daughters or no from or? the wife the wife is saying that he's raping my daughters which is like you you didn't want to call it in when it happened lady. yeah Oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Like, why are you waiting till now? Exactly. I don't like this cat. Mr. James was taken into police custody and administered a polygraph test. In regards to anything related to Tim and Kelly, he was telling the truth, according to the test, about the fact that he had nothing to do with their disappearance. In regards to the sexual assault, however, he claimed the allegations were false. And according to the test, this was a lie. He ends up being convicted of a sexual assault on these young girls and sent away to prison documentary does not tell us how long the sentencing was he does remain a suspect in tim and kelly's disappearance however since he passed the test they had nothing to go off of wow so he got convicted of what he was doing to his daughters Mm -hmm. that it took her so long to say Mm -hmm. but down to coincidence like the shirt the blood on the robe the knots in the blood dude they don't mention again throughout the whole documentary what the yeah, I don't know why they didn't. I, I even watched it again. Like, are you sure you didn't want to yeah, mention like, that's what the pretty hell that important. was? So at this point, we're only left to speculate in regards to him. Tim and Kelly's parents coordinated their funeral and buried them next to one another. This way, they could really be together forever. I thought that part was, like, really sweet. Mm-hmm. In June of 1983, three years after their unfortunate passing, two men come into question. This part, Jen, is gonna, like, piss you this is like your 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 trigger <laughs> my patience <laughs> yeah yeah henry lee lucas and otis tool 
These men had been arrested on several minor charges, hensing on the fact that they were in jail for minor charges. They began confessing to dozens of murders, and this sounds to me like a lot of criminal braggadocia, but you know, let's just go with it. Regardless of how investigators feel, which is the same as how I'm feeling, mm-hmm. they can't ignore it. They get involved and try matching any cold cases with the things that these men are saying. Interrogations ran for hours and days and just a long time. Cold case files are ginormous, as we have learned. Investigating these two men took a ton of time and resources. I cannot emphasize that enough. For nothing. <laughs> okay. I'm already mad, guys. <laughs> According to them, they had abducted men and women in the past, sexually assaulted them, and sometimes, not always, sometimes, would kill them. There were about four or five cases in the Wisconsin area that could have been them. They had a drifter lifestyle, so they were always moving around and could never seem to stay in one spot for very long. On Halloween of 1978, this would be a year before Tim and Kelly's case, a young Jane Doe was found murdered wearing only orange socks. She was never identified, nor could they find out who had killed her. This murder happened in Georgetown, Texas. Henry and Otis claimed that they were the ones who committed the crime. She had been strangled and raped, similar to the way Kelly had been. These men continued to confess to hundreds of rapes and murders. Hundreds. I'm mad. Officers did, of course, believe they were confessing to brag and boost their own little ego. Then it comes down to this case. What do these men have to do with what happened to Tim and Kelly. According to them, they were in the area at the time of the murders. Officers informed the family of this confession and they felt a little bit more at peace, which I don't know if it's protocol, I have no idea, but if it's not, why would you tell the family if you're not sure? I know. Because now the family's feeling like a little, It's coming know, to like an end, like to closure. Like closure, exactly. However, Upon further questioning, officers came up with a timeline that completely eliminates these two men as suspects. Henry and Otis were in Wisconsin from September to October of 1980, and Tim and Kelly were killed in August, which means they didn't even show up until after they were killed. Once this news came out, the case went completely cold. The case stays cold for over two decades. Wait, so what happened to those idiots? Okay, so apparently there's a movie on this Henry Lee Lucas character, and he actually was a serial killer. No way. Yeah. So it looks like Henry was actually a serial killer, and Otis was his drug dealer. That's from what I'm gathering from the summary, but I'll get more into that when I talk about his case. But from for this documentary, I they do not come up again. Okay, they never mentioned it again. Mm-hmm. Like I said, the case stays cold for over two decades. During this time, Tim's father sells the farm as it was supposed to get passed down to Tim. He also gives Tim's old car to his other son, Patrick, which I initially thought was weird, and then Patrick says something very sweet. He says that he claims he still drives it because he doesn't want Tim and Kelly to feel like they've been forgotten. So it is now 2006, 26 years after the murder. I get so mad. (laughs) Okay, go ahead. It's been a while. But hey, we have to give technology time to advance. I know, I know. District Attorney Susan Happ is going through cold case files, and she comes across this one. It stands out because she remembered the case. She was eight years old when news first broke out. She wanted to know what happened, and now she had the resources at her fingertips. She assigned this case to Detective Chad Garcia. This might be the only Chad in history that I actually like. The only Chad we like? (laughs) I typically don't get along with Chads. (laughs) We just don't like them. Sorry, Chads. (laughs) The first thing he noticed is the limited amount of evidence. The only thing they did have was Kelly's clothes. Keep in mind, like I said, DNA technology has advanced. So he submitted the clothes to the crime lab and it comes back with more than what they could get before. They had found seminal fluid on the pants and underwear. There were three major areas that were used to dump the bodies in evidence. The evidence on that road, the bodies in the wooded area, and the Concord house. It all made a triangle. Detective Garcia said, let's look inside the triangle and close to the triangle. Hmm. He had a pretty good feeling it was somebody local. So he releases information regarding this triangle to the media and he gets a hit. A woman by the name of April calls the station. She said that her father and her family were drifters. They lived in that triangle in the summer of 1980. She tells officers, I think my father could be responsible. Her father's name was Edward Wayne Edwards formerly known as Charles Murray. 
First red flag, this fool's changed his name. That's weird. Yeah. He had written a book in 1972 called To Tell the Truth. He had been in talk shows and game shows talking about that book. And that book was about, or is about, being a master criminal and getting away with crimes. How Mm. he's not in jail? You know what, though? I feel like there are, like, a lot of books out there like that, and we don't think twice about it. But this guy, he was even in the FBI's top 10 most wanted list in the late 1960s. Why is he not in jail? Why is he not in jail? Were they looking for... What did he change his name? Maybe, like, the name change? I I don't know. This man was well known in the media and he had been on police's radar before. He was known for committing robberies, arson, fraud, and double homicide. However, in these cases, he was only ever a suspect, it looks like. In the game shows and talk shows, he claims to be a better and good person. And then he goes and writes that book. After he's already a suspect? No, he wrote the book and then he goes on game shows talking about the book. And now he says, oh, like, I don't do that stuff. Like, I just wrote it. If you read his book, don't read his book, (laughs) you see classic signs of a serial killer. He wet the bed, started fires, and was extremely controlling. Because of his popularity, people wondered how someone so charismatic can be a killer. And we've seen this before. Remember, in general, not always, but in general, killers feel the need to fit in with society so that no one questions them and victims succumb more easily. It's all about survival for them. April tells investigators that he was in the military and had been dishonorably discharged. The exact reason was not mentioned. Military service is important to note because we're looking for a knot tire. Edward Edwards is now the prime suspect in this case. I'm sorry, I can't with his name. Dude, I just wonder, like, okay, he's our, his last name is Edwards. Like, oh, what should we name him? What about Edward, you know? Like... Oh, well, no, it's, that was, that's the name he changed it to. Oh. His name was Charles Murray, and then now it's Edward Edwards. I can't, like, I know. I that just sounds like a serial killer name, though. So does Charles Murray, though. Doesn't well, it? Well, because of Charles Manson, That's probably. true. Oh, and here's a fun fact. Not even a fun fact, a fact. This dude was interviewed back in 1982. 1980 as well. For the, um... For Tim and Kelly. Oh, shoot. They looked at him. But I'm telling you, that charismatic, like, they like, just know how to dude? get out of it. Yeah. How you doing? Like, so relaxed. <sighs> That's why I hate lie detector tests, because I feel like the real psychopaths can pass them. At the time, he had broken his nose and claimed that it was from a deer hunting incident. The rifle supposedly kicked back and hit him in the nose. However, deer hunting season was in November. Again, the murder happened in August. Police in 1980 did not connect the dots and let him go on his merry little way. Detective Garcia went to visit Edward's old landlord, the one that owned the home in the Triangle. The landlord claimed that Edwards had moved out of the house in the middle of the school year shortly after the murders. Paranoia from being interviewed, I assume. The landlord did also find a rope in the garage. He also had knowledge that Edwards kept the 57 revolver in his van. The revolver is not relevant because that's not how Tim and Kelly died. But the van was eerily similar to the one that was at the Concord house. On top of all of this, Edwards was a handyman at the Concord house at the time of the murders. So where the wedding? Where the wedding was. Oh my god. Where Tim's car was. So now they had enough to go to Louisville, Kentucky to get this man's DNA. Now he's in Kentucky. (laughs) It is now July 31st, 2009. Detectives are at Edwards' residence, and the man is not doing good health-wise. He is in a wheelchair, on oxygen, and very overweight. He had been acting extremely nonchalant and even agreed to a DNA test. Wow. He probably thought technology didn't advance. He's probably stuck in the past, dude, to where he, like, didn't... What do you mean? Like, he probably didn't realize all the changes that were going on, like, as far as DNA and... Maybe, exactly. He probably figured, like, oh, if they didn't catch me last time, they're not going to catch me this time. Yeah, exactly. So DNA comes back, and it was a match. We got him. It's not over yet, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. According to investigators, on Saturday, August 9th, 1980, Tim and Kelly were walking to their car, and Edward decided that Kelly fit his victim profile. He attacked them, and Tim got in a good hit on Edward's nose. Edward takes out a knife and stabs Tim, throwing him into the van along with Kelly. They do not know what happened to the van. However, they can probably assume this is where the rape and strangling occurred. Edwards is acting as though this is no big deal. Oh, okay, with my wife. She's a big concern. I'm joking. No, they're not. I'm joking. I'm joking. I know you. 
So one of the traits of a psychopath is this superficial charm that they can turn on and off at will in order to do their bidding. I don't hey, want... thanks. No problem. They call you Cal. Is that what you told Kyle? me? Kyle. Kyle. Thank you. Gotcha. Thank you. Myself and the DCI agent speak with Edwards. I'm willing to make a statement and answer questions. I do not want to alert this time. Do you agree with that? Well, we'll go over them again if you're not comfortable. Yeah, not everything, com everything's fine. Everything's fine. Okay. He waves his Miranda rights. And we explain a number of things showing that he is responsible for this. We're trying to get him to give us his version of events. This is your shot. I mean, this is your show. Oh, I... there, if, if there's anything you want to get off your chest, I'm, I'm yours. I'm here to listen to you. But unfortunately, this is your only shot. He looks disgusting, dude. What does he look like? Describe him for the people. He's like, oh, I'm not trying to be mean. I just don't like him. But he's like an overweight older man. He just looks like he doesn't care about himself or his appearance or... I don't know. Because there are people that are older, you know, they take care of themselves. Like a slob? I don't want to say it. It looks like he lives in a basement. Yeah, no. It's like hard. I can't even imagine him being the, the murderer only because it's like he, he's an older person, you know? And it's just like, you think like, oh, he's just this old man. But it's like, no, you have to remember this was 26 years ago when he was more than competent to do this. So officers do show him the evidence they have on him, including the DNA. He denies everything. Over eight hours of interviewing and this man will not budge. He is so relaxed and investigators are absolutely frustrated. One detective played to his ego and brought out his book. He asked him for an autograph and then they built rapport for a while. And then Edwards confesses to something. He said he did have sex with Kelly, but it was consensual. Like, really? Okay, Ew. that's bullshit. With this and only this, though, if this was all they had, the burden of proof would still be on the prosecution to prove rape, which they couldn't do with the decomposing body. But if that's not compelling enough for a jury, he makes another comment. And this comment was not initially heard by detectives in the interview. Watching the tapes again, volume up, slowing it down a little, Edwards mumbles, damn it, I killed her. And that's the confession. He later pleads guilty and is sent to prison. And while in prison, he confesses to two other murders, Bill Lavaco and Judith Straub. His goal was to get the death penalty as his health was failing further and he was already in prison's infirmary. Officers did not want to give him what he wanted. On top of that, there had been too much time passed between the murders he confessed to for the death penalty to still apply. Which is wild because that means if somebody was killed X amount of years ago, they can't get the death penalty? Apparently. And then, in another attempt, he confesses to the killing of his foster son, Danny. <gasps> yeah, this case was death penalty eligible. Before getting an answer to any of these confessions or his sentencing, on April 7, 2011, he passed away from natural causes while in prison at Columbus, Ohio. At the end of the documentary, we're left with a little bit of a conspiracy. It sounds outlandish to me, but I want to hear your thoughts. People speculate that this dude was the Zodiac Killer. The reasons are as follows. He was a truck driver, he traveled to Northern California, and he was in Northern California around the time of the Zodiac killings. The Zodiac killer targeted couples. He also signed things with 13 symbols. Edward Edwards, 13 letters. Charles Murray, 13 letters. I mean, you never know. And then the whole book thing? That but is what true. Did, what, what is the time? I'm not too sure. Like, what are the time frames of the Zodiac killer? So, his last known killing was in October of 1969 so he confessed to killing that um see but that's the thing if you wanted the death penalty so bad confess to all of them yeah say you're the zodiac killer so i don't think so yeah maybe not and i feel like with his ego he'd probably want to go out harder than what he did yeah honestly but anyway that is it for today guys thank you for listening and again five stars wherever you're listening also um go ahead and add us on instagram which is at consuming crime mm-hmm Facebook, and then Facebook. Too. Consuming Crime. All right, guys, thank you for consuming crime with us. Peace out. Toodles.